Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, I'm especially excited to have Steve Plummer, who's one of the top copywriters and direct response marketers in Australia. Steve is one of Australia's highest paid and in-demand copywriters and is the personal copywriter for Australia's millionaire maker, Mel Emery. Steve is responsible for tens of millions of dollars in sales. His last real estate campaign was sitting at nine million in sales as of now. And we were at the bar at Titans actually, and you mentioned this, okay. and I was like, we have to talk about this, but not now. <laughs> We need to record it so other people learn from it. And he also wrote the copy for Harry Dent Tour earlier in the year, which was a multi-million dollar event. Steve, thank you so much for joining me at 5 a.m. in Australia. <laughs> Thanks, Jeremy. Look, it's, uh, I must say, it's, uh, I'm very humbled to be um, invited and it's an honor to be here. And um, yeah, late at night um, at the bar at Stamford um, at the Titans event probably wasn't the most appropriate time <laughs> to be recording our conversation. This yeah. is perfect. So thank you very much. Yeah. yeah, I'm excited to hear your big lessons, mistakes, what worked, what didn't work in your journey. And I will always include a fun fact about the guests. But before I tell people about the fun fact that most people don't know, I have to ask because I've been waiting since the Titans to ask about the real estate campaign that's sitting at $9 million in sales. Tell us what you did, what was working, what you had to change to make it work. Okay, well, it was... Um, it, it, the, the, the client was a, a client of Mal Emery's, and, and we, we did have a, a big mastermind um, about it. And believe it or not, most of those sales came from a webinar. Um, so you know he was selling um, you know 450 half a million dollar properties from a webinar um, so the campaign involved um, generally his house list driving traffic to the webinar via email via direct mail um, and then following up from uh, that webinar um, you know with again with email with direct mail um, and, and and those sorts of things so it was you know if you had have said five years ago look I'm going to sell real estate um, just sitting in front of my computer, um, you know, people would think you're crazy, you know. Um, so it, it's it, it's a, a Some an interesting. Some people don't know this may still think that. Yeah. Crazy. <laughs> well, absolutely, you know. But it, it's just a testament to how how quickly and how much I guess technology has changed and um, what possibilities there are available for the entrepreneurs today. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and and that was that was a lot of fun because it. You know his costs were were kept down. Um, you know because it wasn't a, a big event. Um, you know it was it was fun writing the copy because we had some really good material to work with. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it was it was it was one of those ones where um, you know everything just fell into place and and it worked really well. You know one of the favourite sayings I've heard is that um, yeah, no one thing brings down an aeroplane. If you watch the air crash investigator programs, it's true. It's a series of events that happened yeah. that um, lead to you know. Well, the, the reverse is is also true. No one thing makes it fly. So, you know, if, if you say what was the one thing that worked, and this is what yeah. I, I find too, people look for the one thing, and I, I think that's human nature. You know, we we all want fast. Fix. Yeah. yeah, we want fast, easy, quick, you know, give, give me the one thing, just just the one thing, the little thing, that you know, and <laughs> it, it's success right. in my view is, is and in sure. my experience is never as simple as that, you know, it was a, it, it was, it was a, a, a highly responsive with a list that had a great connection, it was mm -hmm. um, a really strong marketing message, it was a, a really well scripted presentation, it was good follow up, it was, you know, all of those things, you know, that, that led yeah. to the success of that. Yeah, you're right. And it all fell into place because you put it in place because you had, you know, multi-channel, the webinar, direct response mail, the email. So tell me, break down each of those. What was working with the webinar, some of the things that the copy, what was working with the direct mail and what did you find worked, some of the things that work with the emails? Yeah, it, this this was different in that, well, not different. I, I, I went a little less... On the emotion, yeah. um, Tell me about you know, that. get get, get uh, you know. Often there is a tendency, especially when you're you're selling um, the opportunity to make money, 
the, the, I guess the fallback position for a, a lot of us in the industry is to push the, the Greek gland as it were. You know, you'll, you'll get rich, you'll be secure, you'll, you know, your family, all those sorts of things. And, and I certainly did that. But, uh, you know, in, on reflecting, it, 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 because the product was so strong, um, it was a lot more product focus and, and um, you know, if the, the likes of Dan Candy will probably just go, oh, no, you, you know, the emotion is what buys and he's 100% right. But in, in this particular instance, um, you know, a lot of the features and benefits of the product, because the product was so strong and it was what investors wanted, um, you know, that was a huge um, hook and a huge draw card to make this um, campaign work. Mm -hmm. So give me an example. What were some of the hooks in there that made it work? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, it, it was a, a little bit like the, um, I think I did tell the story of um, everyone's got a one that got away story. You know, I should have bought property back then and oh, if only we'd bought this now. You know, so there was a bit of that uh, emotional hook in there. But also um, the particular product was um, uh, um, the CBD. Now imagine if you had been able to this all downtown, what Americans call downtown, we call the CBD, the central business district where all the tall buildings are. You know, it's where the rents are highest, land values are highest. So imagine if you had been able to buy in a, in a, in a city, in a city land, you know, I mean, it, they just don't make it anymore. It's only open to commercial. So this was for a, a regional area on the Gold Coast. Um, and I guess in American terms, it's sort of a little bit like Miami. Um, the Gold Coast is like Miami, Florida. Um, uh, you know, very touristy, a lot of high-rise buildings. Well, there's, they're building, a, I guess, a town centre a little bit inland from that and there's, there's huge infrastructure going on. So, I mean, it, it's something like the fifth largest city. I'm just racking my brain for the, for the notes that, that I took in the research. It's something like the fifth largest city in Australia or will become that. Um, so, it was a once in a lifetime. And, and this was the key thing too. It was the big idea behind it. You know, we, we strategized over this. We... Um, you know, we, we really um, agonized over the hook that we would use, and yeah. it was the once-in-a-lifetime real estate deal. Yeah. So what um, were some of the things you were debating over? You went with the once-in-a-lifetime. What were some of the other close seconds that you didn't, didn't um, go with? Uh, the, the ultimate deal, um, the ultimate real estate deal, um, you know, Boomtown, uh, you know, those, those sorts of things. I, I, I really don't remember why, yeah. and I think it got down to... Um, the deal of a lot, the real estate deal of a lifetime, and the once in a lifetime real estate deal. I think that they just had a little bit more rhythm. The once in a lifetime real estate deal, and that was probably why, um, you know, we we um, we went with that. And um, because who who does get a chance to buy, um, you know, prime residential freehold real estate in the middle of a city? Mm -hmm. um, it just it just doesn't happen, you know. And so that's. Um, you know, if I can just interrupt myself, it is like the sun is just coming up and I'm, you probably can see behind me, so I might just put my go ahead. down. Yeah, That's go ahead. Right, Jeremy. Yeah, go ahead. Live, uh, live TV at its yeah. best. Hang on, sorry. I see the fence. Uh... Yeah, so I was getting, <laughs> I was getting a little bit of a <laughs> shadow through there. So, yeah, sorry. That, that's probably a bit better. That's good. Yeah, so I want to know how you write what worked with the direct response and the email. Do you write differently to to those mediums, or how do you construct that? Okay, generally, what I do is I write the main sales piece first, and when I've got that main sales piece first, um, it's it, then the other copy flows because I can use bits of that, and and the the campaign then becomes consistent. Uh, actually, one of the other things that we did was that the um, the list was highly segmented as well. So, um, the you know the let's just say there was five thousand on the list. I'm, I'm not going to give you exact numbers. That's not you know that's commercial inconfidence. Let's say there was five thousand on the list. The top um, forty who had been or fifty whatever that number was were identified as being ready to buy now. You know in terms of um, where they were at as investors, and so they got a separate message. Um, uh, it was a similar message, but it was a, a much more detailed um, kind of thing. With hey, look, everyone's getting, everyone has to go to the webinar um, because you're one of our top clients. Um, you know, we're happy to deal with you one-on-one -on -one kind of thing. Then um, a, another segment of the the list, the, the second sort of let's just say it was 500, um, got a different message, and then the the most of the list got a, more, a broader message. So it was the it, the copy and the the um the strategy behind it was that each part of the list got a different 
um, a, a similar message, but a differently targeted message that had um, a slightly different twist to it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and and but that was that's always the big thing that I, I do. I get that main sales piece first, and once we're happy with that, uh, the client's happy with that. I'm happy with that. And then we roll out the rest of the stuff. Mm-hmm. So, how do you incorporate direct mail in the campaign? Uh, okay, th- this one had um, a, a lumpy mail letter with it, with a sales letter behind it, um, and I. Th- I think from memory it might have been, uh, I sent a pair of socks, you know, this deal will knock your socks off kind of thing. Um, <laughs> and then and then, <laughs> then there was a sales letter behind that. Um, and I think then we did a postcard after that as well um, mm. as a follow-up, you know, hey, hope you, you know, there's not too much time, you've got to register for the webinar, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and then, then they had the emails and so forth um, during the campaign as well to, you know, to drive them to, to the webinar, um, you know, and then the sales process kicked in after that. So it, was, you... it was by expression of interest as well. The, 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 it wasn't, um, um, you, know, you know, by directly, you know, here, here's all the details, you know, give me $500,000, you know, it was a little right. bit more sophisticated <laughs> than that, of course. You know, it was the expression of interest and, right. and then their sales process um, kicked in after that, yeah. So where do you get the ideas for lumpy mail such as knock your socks off and, and setting a pair of socks that's so creative? Um... Yeah, uh, look, I don't know. It just comes to me. Um, you know, I, I guess I'm thinking. That's a good question, actually. Uh, I, I'm thinking um, one, what's going to get their attention. Yeah. Um, two, what what's sort of tied in or appropriate to the campaign. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, because there are some things that just aren't appropriate. You know, and you don't want to send. Um, like a bag of sand and have it rip, you know, and then be a mess and annoy, annoy the person. So it's got to be something that's going to be appropriate right. um, you know, to, be, to send in the mail. Um, and, yeah, look, I, I don't know. I, I'm just I, wondering what I, your, if you have this creative process that you go through, maybe you like look around the room to see what objects are in the room or you look at a certain website to get ideas. What do you do for that creative process? Yeah, I, I often, I well, don't often, I have in the past gone to, um, you know, the cheap $2 stores, you know, and just look around. Mm-hmm. Um, I get, get ideas from that, you know, little party blowers, soldiers, um, erasers, erase the mistakes, a straw, the, this is the last straw kind of thing. Um, you, know, you know, the old ones like a watch for time ticking away, you know, that's, what I, yeah, it just, it just, and I have done as well, I have done a fair bit of teaching of, um, lumpy mail from the stage and um, you know that I, I do that in a workshop format so I often I, I do have a general kit bag of things that I yeah. I use and but I, I like to, to look for different different lumpy mail things yeah. just to because I, I think that works really well it's when phenomenal can, yeah 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 when, when you can get the person at the end to go ah you know when you you know why have I attached a pair of socks well because this deal is going to knock your socks off when you when you get that ah oh, i think you know, they emotionally buy into it and you connect with them and and that has a bigger chance of um you know of succeeding so i'm always looking for what's going to give that ah oh, yeah when the person reads it you know and and i think when yeah. you do bang you've, you've nailed it yeah so what's another one of the fun lumpy mails you've sent um, actually, just, sorry, just going back to to that the the socks one. Um, yeah. The client said that he had one of, one of the people who received the letter, um, and he the, the client said, "Look, I, I I love the letter so much. I showed it to five of my friends, and they want to join your webinar." Um, you know, so that was that, that was really that's cool. Fantastic, um, yeah, yeah. You know, so that's someone marketing for yourself. Um, uh, it's a wow factor. Um, so I'm curious, yeah, yeah, what other wow lumpy mails you've sent? Um, recent ones with the squishy brains, you know, no brainer deal. You know, the, you can buy a little squishy soft brain. <laughs> right. um, um, I, I actually, I do remember not me, but um, from GKIC, from the Dan Kennedy organisation, um, they sent a, a bullet. You know, about the magic bullet. It was probably eighteen months ago. Did you receive that? Um, I didn't. Yeah. Uh, I um I didn't receive it. I got a nasty note from customs um saying um <laughs> you know, that I'm trying to import firearms, so that was really interesting. And it's it's interesting because I um I um sorry I, I um 
a number of people in Australia received that. And I said, oh, I didn't even get my bullet because I had to write a letter to customs saying that, you know, it wasn't a non, non-explosive non firearm, da, 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 da. But it got through customs for some people. For me, I got a nasty no. But, uh, <laughs> sorry, that was just interesting. Yeah. Um, you're on the do not yeah. fly list now. Yes, yes the- obviously. I'm, uh, I'm, I've got a target on my back. Um, I'm suspicious. <laughs> um, the, the, uh, yeah, the, so the squishy brain, so it's a no-brainer deal. Um, yeah, just a, a drinking straw. This is the last straw. Um, a little cocktail umbrella. Um, I, I did send once. Um, I think that was for a shade sale place. Um, you know, sipping cocktails by the pool under your new shade kind of thing. It might have been a pool company. Um yeah, just just lots of different yeah, different things like I love that. Those. Um, yeah, yeah, they're, they're fun, and that's a, an interesting thing. The the um, the difficulty though sometimes is sourcing them, um, and especially it's in the states, it's a lot easier. You've got a couple of companies that do that. Um, you know, I always tell clients just just go to the two dollar shop and you know buy as many as you can. I mean, we do have fulfillment houses that do that, but it, it can be a little bit problematic. Um, you know, because we're just not as big as here in Australia as you are in the States mm-hmm. in terms of the direct mail industry. Yeah. So, Steve, we'll, I'll bring up the Harry Dent because I want to hear about the Harry Dent tour. But yeah. I yeah. also, you know, people looking from the outside and even when I read through your website, people just see the results now. They didn't. They don't see what it took to get there. So I want to kind of paint that picture to see what it was before you were writing these million dollar, multi-million dollar campaigns and I always like to include a fun fact. Fun fact about you, Steve, that you're saying is you've been coaching soccer, your son's teams, for 10 years. Yeah. You have four kids. So yes. how do you do all of this and have four kids? I have two, I have, and it's hard enough. So <laughs> yeah. what are I have some no of your... What are, see, see all this gray hair? I'm really 21. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what I say. Like, uh, I, I don't know. You know, it's... You, you just like, you what's just your do. schedule look like with four kids and trying to get work in? And no, you work insane. from home, right? I do, I do. So you're constantly interrupted. How do you not how do you stay focused? Yeah, good question. Um I, do, I can talk about writing rituals now. Yeah, um, go ahead. Or, or do you want to do you want to say yeah, that? Yeah, no, go ahead. Better? Yeah. Okay, okay. Um mostly I, I do find it um a little bit distracting at times when the kids are home, um, especially boys being boys. You know, the four boys. They're, they're, no, no, two girl, two older girls, two younger boys. Okay. So the girls are teenagers, boys are twelve. And, Even worse. Um, no, and, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know, um, boys are a little bit more physical. So where the girls will be nice and quiet, the boys will tend to, if there's some disagreement, um, you know. I'm, you know, so that that does become a little bit distracting during school holiday vacation yeah. times. Yeah, so um, what do you do? Uh, I close my door. <laughs> that doesn't work. <laughs> oh, look, no, they're, they're, they're pretty good. Um, you know, I, I, you know I, I guess I work flexibly as well. I'll get up in the mornings beforehand, you know, like... Waking up for me at 5 a.m. is is not uncommon. No, I'll work for a couple of hours. I'll probably go for a, a, a run or a walk with my wife. Um, you know, come home, have a cup of coffee, get them, mm-hmm. get the kids ready for school, get off to school. Um, you know, depending on on how I feel, I, I might go and work in a cafe for a couple of hours because I find if I'm at home for too much of the time, it, it's a little bit isolating. Yeah. Um, you know, and you you do tend to become, I don't know, a little bit insular or you know, weird. You know, yes, if you yes. if you're like that, um, I'm your company I'm, today. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm very mindful of the fact, though. Um, you know, the 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 need to be very disciplined in work. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. when you're working, you're working, and um, you know that that drive, that discipline, just comes from you, from self. I've, I've always been like that. It's just kind of it's kind of me. And you know, there's that old saying: how you do one thing is how you do everything in yeah, life. Yeah, I love and, that saying. Yeah, yeah. You know, so. So when I, I coach kids soccer, it's very focused and driven and, and success orientated. When I, I work, it's focused and driven and very success orientated. Um, you know, when I, I, I go for a run, I, I do. It's focused and so you know that's just kind of that's just kind of me. Um, you know, um, but not everyone's like that, and that doesn't mean that the way I do things is right. Yeah. There's many ways to be right in this world, yeah. um, but but in terms of actual physical writing. Um, I, I write in 33-minute blocks. I can't remember which of the greats. Was it was it Ogilvy or Capels or, or Eugene Swartz? One, one of the greats, it just escapes me which one it was. It's a, 
Yeah, 33 minutes. Um, it, that, that's the optimum time that you can focus for. So I'll put some Baroque music on, um, um, and that helps get to um, you know to that alpha brain state and um, focus. 33 minutes. I um, have a timer going. Just my iPhone next to me. Um, it goes off. I'll get up. Walk, head, earphones out. Get up. Walk away. Go and um, stretch. Um, pat the dog. Walk around in the sun for a little. It's important to have the sun on you as well. Um, that's an important energy kind of thing. Do that for five minutes. Come back. Right for 33 minutes. Get the headphones in. And away I'll go. Um, yeah. So the, that that short sharp focus. Bang 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 bang. 33 minute blocks. Um, and especially with the Baroque music going, I find is, is, is very, it gets me a lot of writing done quite quickly. Like um, the, yeah, the, the other thing that I do is I generally write in the mornings when I'm freshest. And then in, in the afternoon, evening is when I will do interviews, um, you know, phone calls, um, meetings, you know, that kind of thing. So um, I'm not great at writing at, um, at, at three or four o'clock in the afternoon. Um, I'm usually a little bit tired, um, you know, so it's, it's, it's that kind of AM is writing for me, PM is other kinds of activities. I mean, look, there are some days that... You know, it's three o'clock. I'm just on beat. You know, writing can be an emotional kind of thing. So, I mean, I just clock off. I'll go to the beach if I'm not running kids around. But usually, um, if I have to clock yeah. off, it's then to go and run run kids to sport or you know yeah. what, whatever they're doing. Um, so, what's one yeah, of so the that, most emotional of... pieces that you've written that you consider that you've written? Uh, um, most emotional. Well, that's a good question. Um, the uh, I don't know if it was emotional. I did, I did do a a, a direct mail letter for um, a fencing company um, out west. Um, you know, Australia. If you, if those who are listening aren't from here, uh, we're not like the US where we've got a lot of population in the middle. You basically go away from the coastal fringe and it's semi desert and desert for the rest of. Um, it's very hot and dry. There's a lot of um, pastoral land out there, though sheep and cattle country. Um, so we get big, big stations, big ranches, um, and so forth. I, I did spend when I was teaching. Or probably you'll probably ask me about my backstory soon. But uh, when I was teaching, I spent two years in a small cattle and sheep um, community, and that was a great really? life experience. But yeah, yeah, that was um, <laughs> a thousand people in town. It was um, <laughs> yeah, really, really interesting, really good, important part of my life. Um, but I, I did a um, a, a campaign for. Um, uh, a, a, a fencing supply company in a small town in one of those sort of regions and um, they were really having trouble because of the drought and when it gets dry um, you know kangaroos uh, are lovely fluffy crude cute creatures to you know to, to you guys but to to farmers they're an absolute the pest, pest. Yeah. yeah because they eat the grass for the cattle and um, oh. uh, you know you you're you, you can shoot them, but you know you've got to have a license and da 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 da. da. Um, but they are a, an absolute menace. And I remember one day when um, I was out west, and um, it was very dry, and so there's a lot of kangaroos on the move. And they, they there's, there's thousands of them. They, they, they just look for the green feed. And and the farmer said to me, "Look, there's thousands of the bastards. Look at them out there, you know." And in a in a tough farmer sort of way. And um and and so the headline that I use for um, for that that particular letter um, to sell fencing, exclusion fencing. So there's, there's certain types of fencing to keep kangaroos out. It's got to be a certain gauge and certain height and so they can't jump it and so forth. Right, and right. So, so my headline for that letter was, you know, there's thousands of the bastards um, because that was the language that farmers spoke. Right. Um, and, and, and I guess it wasn't, it wasn't so much... Um, you know, emotional as in, you know, you, you did get a tear out, but I, I felt that really connected to yeah. to the market. And you felt the intensity the, of him when he said that. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. And I put a little kangaroo with a target on, you know, on the letter, <laughs> but, um, you know, that the, the, the first, the day that letter hit the letterbox, they, they sold four, 4.5 kilometers of fencing just like that from that letter, you know, um, because it did connect and, 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 and spoke to, um, and spoke the language of the market. And that was really important. Yeah. So I was wondering yeah, that, what you were going to say about that, because I'm thinking <laughs> emotional and then fencing does, yeah. doesn't, <laughs> yeah. doesn't uh, exactly. mix for me. So hmm. I wanted to find out how you got there. Start off, Steve, tell us where'd you grow up? What was it like? What was a big influence for you? 
Okay, so I grew up in Brisbane, Australia. I was born there. Um, I'm normal, you know, you go to a lot of seminars and, and you hear a lot of people and, you know, the, they have this incredible rags to riches story. You know, I was I was down and out. I was I was eating every third day. I was borrowing this. I was, um, I've got the most boring backstory there was. I was, um, you know, the youngest of six kids from a, a lower middle class family you know we weren't well off but we wanted for nothing it was a very happy childhood yeah. um, my parents blessed them are still alive dad's 88 mum's 84 wow. um, you know and I was just it was kind of just a normal 1970s 80s upbringing the 80s what a great decade by the way the the zenith of fashion and music um, in my view <laughs> in the world but, I don't um, know, fashion. I, <laughs> I, I got I got through those periods. Um, Were you the no, youngest? I, yes, I'm, I'm the youngest. So, what was of it six. like being the yeah. youngest of six? Well, it it was interesting because my the, the the first four of my um, siblings are a lot older. Um, my sister, who's two years older than me, mm -hmm. um, I don't know. We were kind of afterthoughts, or. Um, you know, on a we don't want to much say on accidents. <laughs> yeah, yeah, nothing, nothing much on television. Kind of said there was quite a gap between us, so it was kind of um, my sister and I growing up, and then the, the older, the older siblings as they came and went. You know, in a different phase of their life. Um, yeah. But you know, yeah, I we went. We were all educated at um, you know private schools, and um, the the thing that I was that was instilled in me was you know work hard at school value education mm -hmm. um, you know do well at school go to university get a good job um, yeah. what did you know, your parents do mum never worked uh, mum was a, a, a housewife as it kids, were a homemaker that's a yeah, lot, yeah, that's yeah, a lot yeah, of work yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. dad dad had an dad's interesting he he started his work as a um, um, a, a fitter and turner and so he, he didn't go and fight in, in World War Two because of that he was in a protected industry he he did laboring draining and then most of my growing up he was a sales engineer so he did a lot of work in um, mm -hmm. or for some of the big mining companies and so forth um, you know fixing their gears and um, well, he's, that's what his company did um, it, it's really interesting um, it served me well but it also wow. hindered me a great deal I the paradigm of you know, work hard at school, get a good job. Yeah. Um, you know, then you'll never have to worry about. You'll be secure. And and yeah. for my parents, that came because they grew up in the depression. You know, that that was their paradigm of growing up. And yeah. I I didn't really think about this till later in life. But you know, there, there was some sense that for them, the depression was always going to come back. You know, those hard Running times of the depression yeah. and the and the war and all those sorts of things. So it was all about scarcity and security and finding yeah. security. That's really important. Um, yeah. And and unfortunately, that was part of my DNA because yeah. it, I look for something where, yeah, yeah, I, I look for um, a job that would give me that security. So I went and got a, a I went to university, did four years of study, did an arts degree, then did a diploma of education and became a high school teacher yeah. um, and in a government school. So I'm never going to worry about money, the government, you know, da 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 da. Um, you know, I became, I was very good at that, I, I don't mind saying, and, and I became um, a, a head of faculty, I became a deputy principal, but um, at the end of it, I, I, you know, I'd been in a school since I was five years old. You know, and I was just one day I was just looking at there's got to be something more in life to do. Um, now the other thing that I was doing as I was working um, at school was was freelance journalism. I did a correspondence course. I'd, I'd always had this love of writing, yeah. um, and I did a, a freelance journalism course. And I, I found um, a niche in um, in travel writing and sports writing, um, in particular in in boxing. Um, believe it or not, and I've interviewed all of Australia's top boxers from really? from Cos yeah from Costa Zoo down to um, you know down to the the lowliest fighters. And and one of the things that I really liked to do was um, you know because it's t it's a tough sport. It's a very small sport in Australia. You, you might only get five ten grand for about your train you know, three or four months for you know it's yeah. it's a very small market in Australia, and so it's a tough tough sport. Um, so one of the things I like to do was identify a young up and coming fighter and, and do a feature story on them, um, and um, that. Yeah, that was a real boost for their career. They could show their friends and their family, you know, have a big right. page in this glossy magazine. Um, and um, yeah, so I got a kick out of that. It didn't pay very well. Um, although just a, as an aside, um, there, was, there was a fighter by the name of Daniel Geel. He's a, a two-time world champion. Um, 
And I, I, I tell this story when I'm speaking on stage and, you know, it, before I did the story on him, he was just Daniel Gill from Tasmania, you know, in the parlance of boxing. It's from Tasmania, it's Daniel Gill. And, and I mean, I thought he, as my sort of semi-trained boxers, I thought he had a lot of potential. And so I wrote, a, the headline I wrote for him was, Daniel Gill is the real deal. You know, as in he's going to make it big. And so from the moment that article appeared, um, you know, it was from Tasmania. It's the real deal, Daniel Gill. You know, had a nice cadence, a nice rhythm, and he's used that nickname ev from every single fight since that article appeared. Um, you know, in his career, and so I, I say, well, look, you know, to be successful in boxing, you've got to have a good chin, you've got to have a good right hand. They're the things that that make you. But to be really complete as a fighter, you've got to have a good ring name. So yeah, Daniel for sure. Gill had for sure. Yeah, Daniel Gill had the good punch. He had a good chin, and. I gave him the ring name, so I made Daniel Gill a world champion. It completed him, you know. That's that's the the story. I, and don't tell Daniel that, you know. That's um, <laughs> yeah. So that that's a a quirky kind of thing. But that sort of taught me the power of words, yeah. um, and and how important words are. And they're um, huge. It probably gave him a boost of uh, confidence too. Ah, uh, totally, totally. And it was look I, I, to narrow it down. An email one day changed my life, and, and that seems really really weird um, but I, I can distinctly remember it. it I was sitting in this office um, we've since renovated the house then but I was, I was sitting in this office almost in this very chair in this spot um, 2000, 2006 or 7 or something like that um, so I'd been writing I was teaching um, had, a, had a young family because you were teaching um, for 20, oh, 20, years, 20 years 20 years yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so I'd, 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 you know, achieve what I wanted to achieve. I'd, I'd wanted to be a head of faculty. Um, I'd sort of had a go at being a, a deputy vice principal. Didn't I didn't really like that job. It's a really tough job. Um, I never really wanted to be a principal. So it was sort of what's next for me. Um, so I kind of had the teaching skills, the writing skills, um, and and one day I just received this email. I remember it was a Sunday morning, and I'm just reading this email, which led to a sales letter. Um, you know the old the old thing, and and I can remember I was in the the office. Um, the kids were playing, and I I remember my wife saying, "What are you doing in there?" And if you are married and you have kids, it was the kind of tone. That wasn't just a, a curious. I get that every day. Um, Don't worry about it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it wasn't just that that soft inquisition. It was the the sort of tone get over that, here and help that that, that, that really yes. said yes. Um, yes, you need to stop what you are doing and come and pay me and the kids some attention. That, that it was that tone, you know. And, and and I just went. Oh, I'm just reading this stuff. I'll be a, a few minutes. And and anyway, half an hour later and. It, it was interestingly. It was by the the great Ted Nicholas, the the great copywriter and I marketer Ted, Ted Nicholas. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and it was Ted was putting on an event um, called the Dream Information Publishing Seminar in Sydney. And just I was just I read every single word of his sales letter, and I just went, I, I've got to go. I, I've got to go to this thing. Um, and you know, so I went and talked over with my wife. And but you, you know, when you, you have those those men, you know, often you're the you're the biggest impediment to your own success. So I I came up with excuses like, oh, you know, we can't afford it. The kids will miss me. You know, we were going to do X on that weekend. You know, the, no, no, I can't do it. I, I want to go, but no, we can't. Da 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 da. Um, and and to her credit, she was very supportive. She said, well, look, you've never said that before. If you feel you should go. Um, then you should go. And I went, no, no, look, we can't afford it. Don't worry about it. Anyway, she went and then booked my flights and booked the accommodation. She said, no, you're going to go now. So, oh, holy crap. You know, so I flew to Sydney, um, went to this event. Um, the, the thing that also got me, one of the, the attendees there, you know, you'd, you'd go, there was only, I don't know, 40 people in the room or 50 people in the room. Where you was go it? around and in Sydney. Oh, Sydney, um, okay. So, uh, yeah, it's an hour south, of hour's flight south of where I am. Um, and you know, you go around the room, and and you different people introduce themselves, what they do. And there was this one guy sitting up the front, and he said, "Oh, look, I'm a copywriter. I've got five kids. I work from home, just around school hours, and you know, I, I earn over six figures a year." I just went, "I want to do that. That's what I want to do. I've got to go and talk to that guy." Um, and uh, long story short, um, 
I, I went and harassed him and accosted him and um, <laughs> um, I think they call it stalking these days but <laughs> um, you know he I, I offered to work for him for free and, and to you know for him to teach me and um, you know Brett Thompson is his name and, and thank you Brett if you ever hear this um, you know it changed my life working with him because um, and that for me that's a really important key to success if in a field that you want you find a red hot mentor yeah. Um, and and then you you sail on their their, their coat strings because yeah. you're not going to then spend the time and money making the mistakes that they made. Um, mm. And and working with him um, changed my life because it opened the door to um, me now working with Mal Emery. I actually took his spot as Mal Emery's copywriter um, when he moved on to other things. And um, yeah, the rest is history. And it's interesting. One of the the things I, I get. Um, from people is they say, well, you know, it would, it must be easy for you to transition into copyright because you were already doing your freelance journalism thing, you know. So it was easy for you, but I can't do that, you know. As soon as you get that, but you know, there's an excuse coming. Um, well, it, it, my answer to that is, well, not really, because you know, you had all your crap going on that's stopping you moving forward. I have, I had, and have, and still have just as much crap going on that's stopping me moving forward. I think we all have that, yeah. um, you know. And and my look, I'd love to do that, but I can't because is different, but the same to someone else's. I'd love to do that, but I can't because it's just a different because that we, you know, that roadblock we put in in our way. And right. um, yes, it been been a been able to write journalism has helped me to a point, but it's also been a hindrance because. At school, we are taught to write um, to convey information, um, whereas when you're writing copy, much different. You, yeah, you've got it. You're writing to sell, and so it's a whole different dynamic. Um, you know, the, my colleagues and so forth would um, shudder and, and think how my former colleagues at school and how crass the you know, writing to sell is and all those sorts of things. But um, well, you know, let's look at each other's bank balance right now and so forth. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay with that. <laughs> so two things Steve I have a question about one how did you convince him to take you on because he probably had a lot of people asking him and two you know for for you to work with him what were some of the great things that he taught you that you still think about today yeah um, okay how did I convince him because um, yeah. it yeah, sounded like yeah. you were stalking him yeah, yeah. As I said, that was pre-stalking laws. Yeah. <laughs> well, I say that. I say that you, um, you know, facetiously. Um, that no, there, there was. Uh, I, I, we had, we had. Seen, I'd seen seen him at a couple of events, and you know, it wasn't just a, you know, it's like any, um, you know, any relationship, romance mm -hmm. kind of thing. You know, you mm -hmm. you, you you take steps at a time and get out here going. Yeah, remember me? I was there. Yeah. You know, but you took to an to interesting him. step with him. You took an interesting step that I read is you didn't just ask him for help. You you did what? You uh, offered to. Um... I offered to yeah, and and that was that was the key difference. I offered to write for him for free. Yeah. Um, and I, I can distinctly remember him saying, look, I get lots of requests. Like you said, I get lots of requests for people wanting help and wanting them to do it. He said, but no one else had offered to do something for me for free. And um, that that got my, he said, that got my attention. And um, so, okay, let's try you out. Let's see how you're going. Nothing to lose on you then, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And um you know, like you said before, a lot of people just see the result. They don't see what happened um, before that. I mean, I, pardon me, he was doing a, a series of events around the country where they'd do a hot seat. And um, he'd, so the, the hot seat thing would happen in the morning and he'd have to go away and write all the copy, this whole campaign overnight, and present it on stage the next day. And a number of times, um, you know, I'd, I'd get a phone call from him at 2 o'clock on a Saturday afternoon drop what I was doing and write parts of that campaign for him for the next day. And yeah. I, there were times on a Saturday night I was getting to bed at three and four in the morning, you know, because I've been up all night helping him write. Now, people don't see that. They just see right. the result at the end, you know. So, yeah. I mean, I I was prepared. And, and I guess it, I'm not trying to pump my own tires up here, but I, I guess it gets back to um, what I did say at the start. I mean, I, I, I just am driven and focused on things and, 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 and you know, I, I could have easily said, oh, no, I'm, I'm, we're going out to the movies tonight. I can't do that. But it was a case of, well, that's what I wanted to do. So 
you know, focus driven, I made mm. sure I did it. Um, yeah, so I offered to write for free, and then and I can distinctly remember him saying, "No one else has offered to do that before." Mm-hmm. So, um, what were some of the it, valuable lessons he taught you? Oh gosh, how, how long's a piece of string? Um, you know, <laughs> the importance of yeah, the importance of head headlines, um, conversational copy. You know, um, get away from formal formal uh, you know formal english kind of things um uh the the big idea and how you how you've got to have that hook um you know once in a lifetime real estate deal you know that that is a, a huge a huge thing um you know that that you must have and oh look oh, hot, just i don't know swipe files like the you you know, basically everything to do with copy to get me started um was was what brett taught me Mm-hmm. Um, I, I can't really narrow it down to was this or was that. It was yeah. it was everything and, and those individual things and the collective of it and yeah. and probably just having that sounding board. You know that won't work. And move this bit here. You know make the headline bigger. Make that bit smaller. You know just those little things. And mm-hmm. when you're working with someone who knows what they're doing, um, yeah. you know you learn as much by os- osmosis as, as as well as the direct. You know that direct do this do that kind of thing. Yeah. So, Steve, it sounded like, obviously, when you started working with him, that that was a huge turning point. What was another big turning point in your career? Yeah, well, the next the next big turning point was when he left um, Mal Emery um, and Mal asked him, um, you know, well, I need someone to take your place. Who do you recommend? He recommended me. So, I then got offered the, the six-figure gig. Um, and I've been there for you know, nearly five years now um, doing that. It's Mal's personal copywriter. That was, that was a huge turning point. And, you know, that whole thing freed me from um, the the limited paradigm, the small sandpit that I was playing in yeah. um, as, a, as a school teacher. Um, you know, I mean, I, I, I now teach from the stage and instead of in front of a class of, you know, 30 kids, it's 200 business owners. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I work with and advise and help multi-millionaires. Um, you know, I, I share the stage with the likes of, of, of Harry Dent and, um, you know, Alex Mendozian and, and these... Russell Brunson and these these huge, you know, it's just, it's chalk and cheese how, you know, and, and I got back to that one email that I was reading on that Sunday morning yeah. that changed everything. And, and I guess for me, the, the the lesson in life, and this is what I tell my kids often as, or, or, or anyone who asks, because a lot of people do ask, you know, how'd you do it? How'd you get out? You know, da, da, da. I, you know, when you open one door, you just don't know what other doors are going to open yeah. after that. Uh, what what and, lessons did you learn from from Mel? Oh, yeah, huge. It just uh, the, probably there's probably two that stand out. Um, and the, the the first one is there are many ways to be right. Um, and you know that that to me was huge because especially when you start out, you can only take on a certain amount of knowledge. Um, and you know that that body of knowledge that you accumulate kind of becomes your truth. Um, so I, I, I guess when I first started working with him, I had a certain view that things were done this way, um, and he certainly has opened my mind. Well, no, there are other ways to do it, and you know, him saying I might do something this way, and someone else would do it yeah. this way. What was an both. example of that where you saw um, someone doing one thing and he was doing it a little bit different? Oh, okay, pro- pro- probably. Um, Probably a speaking, uh, speaking from stage, and what what works in terms of speaking from stage. Yeah. Um, you know, his way of doing things is to um, have a stack close at the end, um, whereas other people have a, an A B type type arrangement um, in in their close. Um, so that's just a a small example. Um, but but also in copy, you know, I, I would would say, well, what about this example from? Um, no, actually, no. A really good one is um, um, Ted Nicholas's idea of um, you know. And Ted Nicholas has tested this to the nth degree. Of your headline should only have seventeen words, no more. Hmm. Um, yeah, that that was something that stuck that that stuck in my mind. And I remember seeing one of his headlines that was about forty words long, and I went, "But Mal, that breaks Ted Nicholas's golden rule. You can't you can't have a headline that's got more than seventeen words. It's been tested. Oh, there's many ways to be right." That sales letter made X million dollars for me. Oh, okay, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so so just that that experience based learning is is huge. Yeah. Um, so that that's the first thing. There are many ways to be right, and and especially in you know copywriting and marketing, it's a it's a very dynamic kind of field. You know, the 
and, and and it's it's very changeable too. You, what worked yesterday worked in that situation. It's very situational. Right. You might do the same thing For that tomorrow. That specific market too. Yeah. Y yes. Yeah. And you might do the same. And even more narrow than you might do the same thing for that market again, and it just it bombs. You know, everything is situational. Times change. People change. Events change. People respond to different things. You know. So there are many many ways to be right, and you can't get, in my view, stuck dogmatically on. Well, this is the only way of doing things. You know that that limits you. Um, the, the the probably the other really big thing um, that I learned from him was, um, and this is this is really interesting, is that you have got to continually sharpen your saw. Now, Mal Emery is someone in Australia who has um, earned tens of millions of dollars from copywriting from marketing, um, but I'll tell you the. I hate getting a phone call from him um, somewhere around 11 o'clock in the day. Now, he, I live on the East Coast. He lives in Perth, um, and he will be out riding his bike, and that's what he does for, for exercise. Um, obviously, riding a bike is something, um, you know, something mindless in terms of, you know, get into the alpha state, mm -hmm. alpha brainwave, you know, and that's when ideas come. It's also a time when he will be listening to, it might be a Dan Kennedy thing, it might be, a, you know, some other big marketer. And so if I know if the phone rings, it's 11 o'clock here, you know, I'm in, into my day getting something, it's 9 o'clock there, he's into or just finishing his bike ride. And he'll say, I've just had an epiphany. And he'll be either be listening to something or something will come up on the ride. And so what we'd agreed on, or, you know, and I've gone away and done all the copy, he's just gone, no, now I want to go this, you know, that's not it. So if I get through the... You don't answer, clock, the, you don't answer yeah. the call anymore. <laughs> yeah, no, so it's good. It's, it's, so it's a, I look at the phone, 11 o'clock, uh, yeah. Hi, Mal. Yeah, hello. Uh oh, what, what, what two like, weeks of work? Yeah, you just ripped yeah, yeah. Out. Exactly. What two weeks of work am I throwing away now? Um, but the, the lesson behind that, you know, that's just that's tell me about one of the epiphanies. Just, what was one of the epiphanies you remember that uh, he he told you, and you just basically tore up you know, like two weeks? Um. It, that usually happens most promotions <laughs> um, that, that we do. Um, it, it's it often can be around the big idea, um, you know. So we'll agree on a hook or an angle for um, a particular event, um, and um, then actually probably the the one that sticks out most because it did change about five or six times was yeah. uh, we did a big event probably three or four years ago now called Crack the Internet Code and we, we got a lot of speakers in from the states all about the internet because we surveyed the list and they all came back saying we want the internet we want the internet we want the internet so we got um, social media person uh, um, you know a, a traffic person a, an SEO person a, you know all, all these world experts and um, that went from um, from cracked it to eventually crack the internet code um, as the the hook and the big idea behind the event, and it had a few other um, permutations then, and, and yeah, so that you know you, you go along writing um, one particular way, and then uh, no, you know, and, and look at the end of the day, um, he's usually right, you know, in terms of that kind of doesn't work, and it's it, it, for any copywriters listening to this, one of the things I've also found is that. Um, Clarity is a, a really difficult thing for everyone to, you know, all of us to master. Um, and that your clients who you're working with, that, that's no different. And often, um, you know, they they don't see what they want until they know what they don't want. Um, so you you know you, you might agree on the project, and then they look at it and they, you know, no, that's actually not it. I thought that was it, but you know, that's and so that that's one I I haven't yet found an answer to that particular problem. Yes, you can do your research. Yes, you can do a, a really good interview. But sometimes, you don't know what you want until you see what you don't want. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And that's just a I think a human trait. Um, right. and, and 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 Mal's no different to that. You know, he'll, you know, it, it, you know, yeah, yeah, let's go that way, and then it'll bubble away and bubble away, and and, and often, you know, so going for a walk's really good. Going for a bike ride, you know, something that gets you out of your your busyness of your routine and and gets you in that alpha brain state. Um, that's where the big ideas can come in. Yeah, yeah, Stephen, I want to hear some of your best advice, and you have some advice about the seven deadly copyright sins 
and maybe uh, one or two of those. But you also had, I think I was reading, you also had another influential mentor. Um, I think it was Pete. Was Pete? Uh, uh, influ- Pete. Yeah, yeah, Pete Godfrey. Yeah, yeah the, the wizard so, of words. So um, how did he influence you? Yeah, um, he, he both both through um, product and direct training, um, you know, and, and advice and help along the way. Um, I, I bought one of his, oh, this was when I first started out, and that was a real game changer for me. I've put it on my shelf, what's it called? Um, um, uh, oh, his last ever masterclass. Um where over a couple of days he he took the participants through from um, you know writing writing lumpy mail to writing a uh, promotion to writing follow up emails to um, and he put all of those things into a, a home study pack and with all the the examples and templates and as a beginning copywriter being able to open up and see what that looks like to to see what you say in a you know in a a lumpy mail that you know why have I attached a squishy brain to this? There are two good reasons. One, you know, as a template, when you're starting out, that that was a, a great help. So, um, mm-hmm. yeah, those particular things were fantastic when I was starting out. Um, yeah, no, great mentor, excellent copywriter, one of um, the biggest in the country, um, and one of the most successful in the country too. Mm-hmm. And you teach a lot from the stage. So, tell me, what are some of the biggest sins or mistakes that people are making? Okay, <laughs> one of the one of the things I see a lot is um, I think everyone is too quick to write, um, and and there's a number of reasons for that. One, you want to write so you can get paid, or one, you want to write so you can get the ad in the paper so you can get the response. And da, 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 yeah. da. Um, I'm definitely guilty of that, know, no doubt about it. Yeah, just you write know, an email, it, get it, get it out there to see what happens. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, look, I'm guilty of that. I mean, the the work environment I work in is a um, you know strict deadlines, high pressure environment. Um, you know, and especially working with entrepreneurs, they they tend to get ideas quickly and want things done yesterday. Um, yeah. You know, and so, the, I what I have found though is that, you know, the longer you can spend researching, the longer you can spend thinking about, the longer you can spend just letting the ideas sift, going and looking at trees, the ocean, and just being still, you know, I mean, I, I, I know in, in many people's days that's unrealistic, but mm. it is so important to get those really, really good, really big ideas and to even get clarity on what you do. And, and, and the other part of that is spend time to research, find out what has worked for that particular product, that particular market. Mm. You know, I just... I don't think we as copywriters, as marketers, generally, and I'm I'm, I'm probably not talking about, um, you know, the, the the greats, the you know, the the great copywriters, the A-list copywriters, the boardroom, the agora guys. They're probably not them, but the you know, other copywriters and and other marketers and other business owners don't do enough of that sitting quietly yeah. you know we, we, we want to rush we want to get it out and we want to get paid and we want to move to the next one and you know life's busy and then there's the kids and then you know like it, it it's easy to get caught up in that maelstrom where you you do have to um deliberately take time out you know and i'm as guilty of that at times as anyone you know it's just the hustle and bustle of life mm-hmm. and, and and business and you know keeping things moving yeah. where you know if you can just even just promise yourself to spend an extra half hour just sitting, oh, go and grab a cup of coffee or a bottle of water, sit in the sun, have a piece of paper next to you and just stop, you know, and just mm-hmm. whatever ideas come to you, write them down. Yeah. Now, even just half an hour is better than the, the five minutes you spoke or you thought about it before you wrote it. You know, there's an idea, quick, I'll write down, you know, but yeah. But that, that's probably... That's a big the, mistake people are making. The, yeah. What else do you see that big mistakes people uh, are making? Yeah, look, a lot, a lot of headlines are, are poorly targeted or, or very weak. Um, you know, that one of the, the things I see, one of the things I, I teach is that um, I cannot remember where I first saw that resource, but the the, the top 100 headlines uh, um, and the, the top words used in the top 100 headlines, um, you know, you and your were used the most often. Um, and so for me, that's a huge lesson and I will try and write 
my headline has to have one of those two words in it, if if possible. And the reason for that, I mean, it just gets back to that "what's in it for me." Yeah. You know, if that headline doesn't doesn't answer that "what's in it for me" question, then um, you know you've got very little chance of succeeding. And and that would be one that I find business owners in particular and beginning copywriters um, get back to those those big magic power words for your headlines. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. you have the YouTube class that you, that I watched. And you have, I think, 10 of them listed. And then in parentheses, in the top 100 headlines, you have like, you is yep. used like 32 times. And like, you had yes. it broken down yes. by actually yeah. the number of times each of the words were it, used. It appeared. Yeah. 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 And so, so, I mean, when, whenever I'm, I, I used to have that list next to me when I was writing headlines. Um, now it's just kind of there subconsciously. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it, 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 there's worse things you can do when writing headlines than have that list next to you. Right. Yeah. So are there any other big common mistakes that people should, pitfalls that they should avoid? Yeah, um, weak offer, weak response. You know, people buy the offer. Um, best headline in the world, best copy in the world, if you've got a crappy offer. So give me an example sorry. of a crappy offer like, that you modified, uh, that you worked through um, to make a better offer. Because someone may be looking go, oh, this is an amazing offer. And you may look at it and go, that's a weak, horrible offer. Um. Oh, yeah, I. Uh, so I'll give you an example. One thing that worked for for me the last time I made an offer from stage, and this might be a little bit um, not within the um, you know the gamut of what some people are are doing, but um, a number of people said to me at the end, "Wow, that was a great offer." Um, so I, I was speaking down the Gold Coast um, back in. Um, in July, I think it was, um, and I, I actually I pitched my two-day training that I had coming up. So, um, you know, it was a more than a thousand dollars per person. So it was a fairly high-priced ticket item, um, and I, I think I got about twenty percent of the of the room. And wow. um, the, the offer was two days training. Um, it was then um, a a strategy, a thirty-minute strategy call with me, either before or after it, whenever it was convenient for you. It was me then critiquing your copy that you wrote that weekend. Um, to you know, as a like, and I, I think I couched it in terms of it's like having the answers to the test before you sit the test kind of thing. So before you put it in the marketplace, I'll critique your copy. Um, and and then the other thing I had, and this was um, um, a marketing matrix. Um, so. A, the, the, the plan that Mal Emery uses when he, he sits down and, and works with the business owner, he actually allowed me to throw those in as well. So, I mean, it had, you know, a week off would have just been come to my training. Um, uh, an okay off would have been come to my training and I'll give you a, um, a power call, you know, where, where we're strategizing. Whereas uh, an, a stronger offer is come to the training, get the power call, get the... Um, uh, get get me to you know who else has Mel Emery's copywriter, you know as a normal business owner you can't ring me up and get me to critique your copy it just doesn't happen. Who else has Mel Emery's personal copywriter critique your copy before it goes to market? You know so there was it was that component. Then there was the 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 six page marketing marketing matrix funnel which has never been released to the public which Mel Emery doesn't sell which you can also get. So it was it was a series of things mm -hmm. which made the offer better whereas if it had been ordinary it would have just been well look you know I'm really good come to my seminar you know so whatever you, you can stacking do stacking the stacking yeah, the yes, offers yes yes whatever you can do to build value um, you know high perceived value is you know makes it um, that much more compelling. So, yeah, and, and look, you, you, it is about knowing your market. Um, it is about knowing what you can deliver. Yeah. Um, but you know, you've just got to keep in weak offer, weak response. Mm -hmm. I love that one. So, Steve, yeah. tell me, you know, we mentioned the top of the interview about some successful campaigns of real estate. I wanted you to talk about the Harry Dent and some of the research that went behind it and what made that effective. What did you do? Okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Again, what, what was it first of all? For people who don't know, what was the okay, tour? Uh, um, it was called Secure the Future. Um, that was the the big idea behind it, and um, it was Harry Dent. It was John Thomas. I don't know if you know of him in in the U.S. He's a, a hedge fund um, guy. Okay. Um, and it was a number of other speakers. 
just trying to think if there was someone was at the start of the year, and I've written a lot of copies since then. So <laughs> I'm just trying to think if there's any other international speakers. But there are a number of speakers from Australia, um, as well as some of the the really big um, big ones you know, here. And so the the whole premise behind it was that you know Harry Dent will predict the future as he does, um, and um, you know these other guys will help you then plan what you are going to do to secure your future. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so that, that's a very strong hook. I mean, Harry's a very big draw card. Um, and again, this was a multi-dimensional, no one thing makes an aeroplane fly kind of campaign. Mm -hmm. So it was, uh, we used a launch formula, um, you know, something really big, you won't believe he's coming to Australia. Um, you know, I'll get back to you in a couple of days. That was the first kind of email. Um, you know, then, hey, wow, I can now announce the details. Um, um, you know, we're just putting the finishing touches, but we can tell you that it's Harry Dent. Um, if you want to get on the early bird list, so you get first ticket notification, you know, go to this web page and register your interest. Um, when you do, you'll get X, Y, Z bonus. Can't remember what that was. So I think it was an interview with a live interview with Harry Dent. Um, you know, and then that, the campaign rolled it there. So we had uh, numbers escape me, but an awful lot of people. You know, probably. 1500 or more actually no it was more than that um it was probably several thousand on the early bird registration list um and then um then we started to roll out um, the rest of the marketing so full page newspaper ads direct mail postcards um jv lists affiliates so i mean we're, we're talking mountains of copy there were two events there was one in sydney um, and one in brisbane they both had um, somewhere between five and six hundred from memory um, in each of those rooms. Actually, might have even been a little bit more. Um, and we also had um, Mark Burris, who was he was kind of the the keynote speaker as well. And don't know if you know of Mark Burris. Mm. He's a a huge guy in Australia. He actually had actually ran the um, the Apprentice Australia. So he's uh, oh, wow. connected with Donald connected with Donald Trump. Um, yeah. yeah um, so he's and that's, huge um, in Australia, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A very well-known figure. Um, uh, yeah. So I mean, there was there was lots to go into that, and I mean, you know, the, they did spend a lot of money on the on the promotion. Um, you know, news, newspaper ad, full-page newspaper ads are really expensive here. Um, they probably are in the states as well, but you know, we're, we're talking ten, twelve thousand dollars just for for one ad in one full-page ad in. Um, you you got to make uh, that uh, copy convert. Yeah. Yeah, and look at that. That is getting more and more difficult because newspaper readership is going down. Um, you know, so that is that is becoming a less effective media. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're you're almost better off um, going direct mail. Um, you know, just in terms of the spend. But anyway, that's a, an argument for another yeah. time. Um, yeah. So that uh, you know that was um, the, the the campaign, the marketing behind that. One of the things that. Um, um, Pardon me. One of the things that we that they also or we also did was um, had Harry live before the event. Um, so they we ran a webinar. Um, Professor Alan Patching was the the host, and he's, he was the guy who actually um, oversaw the construction of the of the Olympic Games in Sydney when we had that in two thousand. So oh, wow. another you know big big guy. I mean, yeah, and it was he, he did oh yeah he did an excellent job. Um, uh, running the the, the pre-event webinar with Harry Dent, and that was just I, I I rarely watch too many webinars, and I was just mesmerised watching this. It was just fascinating the way he he moved him around and um, you know probed him a little bit about some of his predictions, which didn't come true, but you know allowed Harry to still you know it was just he he was just fantastic, and I, I can't remember the numbers, but it was something like a thousand people, you know nine hundred eighty nine or something on the webinar, you know which is unheard of. Um, you know, for a live webinar in Australia, that's un those sort of numbers are unheard of. Right. Um, you know, actually, it might have even been more. It might have even been two or three thousand. I, I can't recall, but it was it was just people were just going blown away by the numbers for it. Um, you know, so again, all of those things, and, and and this is very instructive in terms of no one thing brings down the airplane and makes it fly. You can't just do one thing and one thing and, and, and expect it right. to work. It wasn't just one email. It wasn't just an ad in the paper. It wasn't just the JVs. It wasn't just the affiliate. You know, it was all of those things. Which go into and it's a very complex thing and it's an expensive a lot thing. Of moving it's a parts, time-consuming yeah. thing. Oh, absolutely, you know. And and again, like you said at the start, people just see that end result. They don't see all that stuff. A little bit like a, a duck cruising along the water. The legs are going really fast, but they're just cruising. You know, people just see the cruising. Um, yeah. What was something, that Steve, that within that whole process surprised you 
that worked well or surprised you that didn't work well that you thought was going to work? Okay. Um, probably the, the newspaper ad. Um, that we, we followed because Harry Dent had come out um, a couple of years before um, and the newspaper ad had worked very well when he first came out. So we did a very similar thing naturally thinking well it, what worked in the past will work again and um but again this get, gets back to the situational thing in the two or three years whatever it was since he was last here newspaper readership has gone down newspapers are becoming less effective as a, a media for in particular seminars um and so the newspaper did not work overly well hmm. um actually it was interesting too because um harry um Harry was on a lot of the um, morning breakfast shows and things like that, um, you know, and he was promoting his new book, and so it all, all went well, but he probably could have just mentioned, too, that he was going to speak at and you can get tickets at, you know, and so we were going, say it, say it, say it, and, um, <laughs> oh, here's my new book, you know, so that was, that was, um, that was interesting, but um, I guess one of the other things that, you know, um, turn up, um, show up rates, so people book in for a ticket, um, you know, so we did a, a whole stick campaign with that, so emails, lumpy mail, um, send physical tickets in the mail, mm -hmm. um, you know, to, to get people to attend. And we had good turn up rates, but that is still, um, and, and people all in every seminar in Australia are still finding turn up rates are, um, are a difficult thing. Um, the, the lower the price point, um, you know, the, the less people turn up. Um, I don't know whether it's uh, people are busy or it's a commitment thing these days or it's easy come, easy go, I'll just go to the next one. But turn up rates are, are always a challenge for anyone in any, um, mm -hmm. you know, any seminar industry. Yeah. So were there any campaigns you could think of that didn't work and why, um, why they weren't effective? It uh, didn't work. Because obviously those both were wildly successful campaigns. Yeah. What was yeah. the one that launched that you had to tweak to make work, but that didn't out of the gate? Um, probably, probably the that crack the internet code one. Um, that we that was a really slow start. Um, I'm just trying to think. We were expecting a lot bigger numbers, um, and. We actually, yeah, that was right. We we had a a fairly big sales letter um, on on the on the website, um, you know, that, that we drive people to, but it just wasn't converting. So we went to a shorter, smaller, punchier one, and um, that started to with a different video, and that started to to get numbers converting. Um, and we never really worked out why the the longer one, because longer copy usually outpulls shorter copy. Um, we never usually we didn't really work out why and and be, you know obviously as well you're starting to get a little bit panicky when you're getting closer to the to the launch date of that particular event um, you know it was still it was still successful in the end but um, yeah there, there was a, a lot of late nights with that one going holy hell what what do I miss what you know what what you know and then, yeah I I came up with something new and something a little bit different with a bit of a twist. Um, um, that was a, a little bit different and yeah and that seemed to, to work and get the event over the line that was um, yeah that was probably that's probably the biggest one that, that hasn't exactly worked as smoothly as it as it probably has and actually I'll tell you one of the, the things I've also found is the, the big thing is connection um, you know if you've got a really strong connection to your particular list to your particular market um, you know then that that is so much bigger and so much more important um, than just about anything. I'll give you a quick example. Yeah. Um, um, I, probably two years ago, G, Dan Kendu GKIC did a launch of one of Dan's products. I can't remember which one it was. It might have been the one that had influential writing as its as its core. Um, now Mal Emery and his organisation came seventh in the world. Um, so we we got all the marketing stuff from GKIC. Um, you know, and the, the the list that we were talking about is is you know some of these these people even in Australia had you know six seven hundred thousand people on their list, wow. um, and some of the big marketers in the US have got a lot more than that you know in the UK and so forth, and yet we still managed to come seventh overall in the world 
and, and I can you know name all the all the big marketers, um, you know who weren't on that list of top ten who had people converting and buying Dan Kennedy's product. And the 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 key thing was, and again it was buy Dan Kennedy's product, but when you do, we'll also give you um, this particular product of mouths. So again, two things there. The connection to the list was so important. I mean, I, I wrote those emails, or, or at least I, I tweaked the emails that um, GKIC sent out because they were pretty good, obviously. Um, but I tweaked those to be more like Mel would be writing them. The voice of um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and um, and then added his offer in. So two things there: the connection was so important, but again, the offer was beefier than perhaps some others did because he added one of his own products to the mm -hmm. offer. Um, and that, so that connection, that that strong offer, is 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 gold in terms of getting people mm. over the line. And and seventh in the world from a fairly small list because it was only a, a small part of the list it was mailed to, um, emailed to rather. Um, you know, it was a an incredible result given yeah, you know, given the, the the scope of it. Yeah. So how do you so find? I was, I was really chuffed with that. Yeah, that's a that's a great example. How do you find? What's the, some of the best ways that people can build a connection? Um. Yeah, stories a good emails? one. Yeah, yeah. So a, a lot of them are are, are stories. Yeah. Um, um, For sure, a good example is actually your about page. You know, people can relate to that. You know, you telling the story about going through twenty years of teaching, and you talk about your journey. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. But actually, but here's another um, an, another learning from Mal. I mean, he often says. Um, you will get tired of telling your story long before your market will get tired of hearing it. Right. Um, you know, so you've got to make sure you tell your story. Actually, here's a here's a really good lesson too. I was speaking on um, a friend stage a little while ago, and I, you know, I, I convert reasonably well. I connect reasonably well to the audience, and um, you know, I just I say I'm Mal Emery's personal copywriter. So it's like saying you're Dan Kennedy's personal copywriter. You know that kind of thing um, that elevates you immediately. Um, so I was doing my normal talk. Um, I didn't make one sale at the end, whereas I would normally make sales. And um, at the end, um, or at some stage during the event, um, someone asked, "Well, how many people know Mal Emery?" Like three hands out of about eighty went up, and I just went, "Holy crap!" There was my problem. I assumed they knew who I was. I didn't do enough to build connection with that crowd because mm -hmm. I assumed they knew who, you know, you know, idiot, <laughs> idiot, you know. Um, yeah, that, that connection wasn't there, and of course the connection wasn't there. Of course you're not going to buy. Yeah, I mean, just crazy. You know, man. Anyway, yeah. we, we all we live and learn. Make we all make mistakes. So, yeah. uh, you know, I I I tell my backstory. I make sure the connection is, is there. And I, um, you know, I often here's here's one thing. Um, there are there are a number of universal connectors. So when you put them in a story, people automatically, um, without thinking, connect to you. Um, yeah. Number one is kids and family. Um, if you can wrap a story around kids and family, it says without saying it that you're a nice family person, that you have good family values. People don't articulate that, but they connect with that. Right. Um, and so I'll, I'll just give you two. So family is one that if you can wrap a story around family, um, then you know that is a big connector. If you can wrap a story around water, um, that is also a big connector, and um, you might water. notice in my water, yeah, the beach and water. Don't know why um, that just connects to people. I mean, we've all got fond memories of the beach. Um, you might notice in my coaching program sales letter, I talk about I sit and get inspiration from the ocean. Yeah. That's a connector. Yeah, you know, I mean, people connect with it. And I'll give you um, one quick example. I often, when I'm talking to a new crowd, um, I will use the story of well. Um, back in 2009, you know, we took the four kids on a, on a world tour and we we're at South Beach in Miami, Florida. And if you've ever been to the United States, I'm talking to an Australian audience, you'll know there's, um, you know, lots of people, lots of cop cars and lots of novelty t-shirt shops. So I showed them a picture of us swimming at South Beach in Florida. And then I say about an hour after this photograph was taken, um, so there we were walking along the side of the road or on the sidewalk um, eating an ice cream after lunch and we stopped at this novelty t-shirt shop and um, Isaac who was my, he's the older of my two boys, he was 
Um, it was nine at the time, and um, so we're just looking. It was wall to wall, floor to ceiling T-shirts, and and he just starts laughing, and so there's ice cream coming out, and he's laughing. This, and I'm, now some of these things were really rude, you know, normally T-shirt, you know, and and he's just killing himself laughing, and um, I couldn't find out what I'm looking. And I'm like, mate, what is it? When he's going, look down there, down there, down there. And it was this, and I finally saw what he was laughing at. And it was this plain white T-shirt that had just four words on it, and I'm thinking, what the hell? could have attracted a nine-year-old boy's attention out of all that clutter, out of all that clutter. Mm. You know, and it was just four words, plain white, black T-shirt. It said, boobies make me happy. <laughs> and, and I mean, one that gets a laugh. That is funny, yeah. That, yeah, one that gets a laugh. And But two, see, that tells a story about, um, you know, I'd, I'd, given, I'd taken my kids around the world. I'd, I'd shouted them an ice cream. It was a nice, people can picture that Does nice that family. Does that turn off moment. the women, women in the No, 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 no. They love it. They laugh because they know it's true. That's funny. <laughs> yeah, and, and often I would say, you know, well, maybe ladies, you also know that that doesn't change when that nine-year-old boy gets to a 49-year-old boy and that gets another <laughs> laugh, you know, so, um, yeah. Oh, I love that. That's a great story. Steve, since it's Inspired Insider, my question to you is, tell me about, I want to hear about your lowest moment and how you pushed forward through it and also your proudest moment. What was okay. the low point and mm. how you pushed through those tough times? Low point. Uh, low point is whenever um, yeah, something, it doesn't smash it out of the park. Um, you know, when you when you're not the the golden haired child, you know, when a campaign bombs, you know, when something doesn't do as well, that you know that that's tough because it's a lot of uh, you know wasted work. You know, I mean, that's um, that, that that's what was yeah, one that, time where it especially hit you hard? Um, because hmm. again, people only see the results, but they don't see yeah, yeah. those tough times. Yeah. Um, actually, there was a, a campaign I was doing for a, in, in the wealth creation space. Um, the for a number of reasons, but one of them, the, the whole event ended up getting cancelled because, well, for a number of reasons, but primarily, well, not primarily, one of them was the the copy just wasn't pulling, and the um, the, the the guy behind it just went. I'm not spending any more money on this. We're not doing it. No, no, we can, you know, we can turn. Uh, no, that's it. Um, you know, so uh, for for a number of reasons, and and I think one of the, I don't know, I had a lot on at the time, and maybe the copy wasn't as good as it could have been. Um, but that was a real kick in the guts. Um, you know that um, that 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 actually happened. Um, and you know he lost money, and the event didn't go ahead, and promises that were made to people. You know that 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 was a that was a tough few weeks. Mm -hmm. um, um, how you get over that is you yeah. You just how do you keep get going. your confidence back? Yeah, yeah. You look for a little win. You um, yeah. That's an interesting question. Yeah. Well, I don't know. It, We've just gone through this with um, my youngest boy. The the, the um, he's he's a very good soccer player. Yeah. Um, He's in the region that we live. He's in. He's one of the top players. But he oh. he just went for trials for a national what is called the National Premier League. So it's a, a representative for under twelves next year. Um, and he didn't get selected in the top team. He got a, a shadow player spot. And and he he was gutted. It's crushing. Um, yeah, it's crushing. Oh, it, it was. It, it, it's crushing. And it, it doesn't help when you know everyone says, well, you should have got in and you didn't, and you know all all of those sorts of things. Yeah. Um, it, it's it's a game of opinions, and different coaches and people have different opinions. That's life. Yeah. That's that's football. That's yeah. you know. And and so we've been working yeah. through that with him. And and at the end of the day, it's you know I just said to him, well, mate, you know you've it, this is one of those moments in life where. You got a choice, and it's a very black and white choice. It, it, you either you either give up and stop doing it, or you pick yourself up and keep going forward. So, depending on what you want to do, if this has hurt you so badly, then it's it's life saying this isn't for you. So you give up, or you pick yourself up and you move forward and come back better and stronger and work hard to prove that they are wrong. Right. And uh, you know, I, I guess. In that instance, it was a case of you know um, swallowing your pride. Um, for, for me, in that swallowing your pride and maybe going back, having a look at the copy, doing a bit more study, um, rereading some of the great stuff that I've 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 written. Um, to well, you know, I can yeah. do that. I mean, yeah. you know, and it, it it's it's a really good point that you make. 
in that um, you know no one ever talks about their failures. You know, people talk about you know you see oh yeah I did this campaign that brought in three hundred thousand dollars in a day and you know this one made five million dollars in ten seconds and stuff like that and um, you, you know yeah that kind of thing. But you never, in fact, I've never heard anyone get up and say you know well. I did this campaign and that didn't work and you know then the ad that bomb no one rang the number you know no one says that and stuff, it happens but, to every one of obviously oh, every single one yeah. I don't know of anyone who hasn't had that awful sinking feeling of it not working huh. you know and it's hard it's hard not to take that personally um, yeah. but you got a choice you go and you know get a government job somewhere or you you, you right. dig deep and keep going on you know right. and I like what you said actually is one of the tactics you told your son and you use is you look at past successes to lift you up you look at the past successes yep. you had yep. and realize i've done this yeah i could do it again yeah yeah and it's in, in, interesting i in preparing for the call i, I was you know because i knew you'd ask about headlines that worked really well and stuff like that and i was just going back through my files and um i got a kick out of doing that you know because some yeah. some of them bought some of them, and and it was even um, little testimonials that I got from people saying, you know, I've just just you know, it's nondescript startup business. You know, I ran my first webinar, and thanks to your advice, you know, I had yeah. seventy people register and got twenty over the line. And just that event I did back in in August, um, a guy who owns a lawn mowing business, um, you know, he sent me an email saying, oh, you're such a legend. You know, I sent my first ever email out with my with an offer for my highest. My, my highest, my high end product. I've got a twenty percent response rate, and I haven't even done a follow up yet. Oh wow, it's fan! You know, just just little things yeah. like that. Yeah, um, those are huge things. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you know. So I mean, we've talked about those the the big campaigns, but I, honestly, I get as much of a thrill out of helping the the little guy, as it were, and and yeah. hearing that you know just one piece of advice, one one critique, one something has has made a big difference and changed what they do. Yeah. You know that that's really great yeah. because um, people see the the big personality, people see the uh, you know the successful business owner, but behind them there's an awful lot of people who work just as hard and deserve success. So I, right. you know, I, I love those little ones as well. Yeah. They're so really cool. what's been the proudest moment? Um, proudest or moment. One of them. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I don't know. It's um, proudest moment I think has been. Because I, in my transition phase of you know from teaching to to, to copywriting, um, mm. I went through a, a very big period in the wilderness. Whether I you know should I run an internet business? Should I do da, 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 da. Um, So it's a tough leap. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know about you, but I went to a lot of seminars. Um, yeah, I always <laughs> I'm always learning for sure. <laughs> I, I, I mean, because I'm I'm involved in that industry a little bit now. I don't go to so many, but well, you um, speak you uh, speak at them too. So. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, I went to a truckload of seminars in in three or four years. You know, everything paid for free, big events, small events. I went to lots of seminars, and I I, I kind of always admired the the speaker. You know, the someone who could um, you know work with um, move a crowd and yeah. you know inspire them. And, yeah. and so I think the the big thing for me has been going from. The person in the audience yeah. to the person presenting, and yeah. now, um, now as of last August, the person running their own events. You know that that whole transition yeah. has been, um, you know. And I, I was, I gotta say, after two days of training people, I was knackered for several days. You know, I, um, but it was a, a really satisfying moment as well. What's been um, your you favorite? Know, so, what's been your favorite event that you've put on or done that you just thought I am at the top of my game? <laughs> um, uh, the, the favorite, no, probably the, the one I did where it was just me, um, just in August, uh, was me and the 20 odd business owners in the room. Um, and I taught them for two days and uh, we had a ball and you know, we went out for dinner. And so it was a whole, a whole experience that was really good. Um, yeah, yeah that, that gave me a lot of satisfaction. Um, actually, one of the other, another little campaign I did, I, well, actually, I didn't, I, I critiqued the letter and, and, and made some suggestions. I had, um, a lady come to me um, and and she joined my small membership program um, and part of that is a critique every month and um, her husband has invented um, a you know silicon you know um, you know those you know, when you 
um, you know, in bathrooms and that when when two tiles meet, you know, you put a line of silicon to stop yeah, the moisture. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you know the, the the long tubes. It's a bit like a gun. The long tube. No, exactly. Okay, so yes. yeah, okay, good. There we go. Um, so this lady's husband, um, you know, they've got a young family, had invented, uh, and I didn't know this, but apparently um, it's hard for tradesmen when they're working with it to get into certain corners and, and angles and things like that. So he invented a, a bent nozzle that was able to be bent at angles so they could get around corners and, and in little things like this. And they were struggling to sell the thing. Mm. Um, and so she wanted to write a letter to a couple of the, the big corporate players to get the thing in their store. And so she right. said, oh, look, I've sent this letter because um, she was sort of doing the marketing for the for the business. And I've sent this letter. Uh, well, I'm going to send this letter. Can you just have a look over it for me? Um, you know, and like I find with a lot of people who don't have a lot of experience, it was pretty ordinary um, and it wouldn't have got past any gatekeeper and stuff like that. Um, and so... I played around with it and I said, I said, look, let's send them a bag because they only cost like five cents to make. So, I mean, let's send them a bag of these things so they can actually see what it is you're selling. And um, Seems obvious, the, but something people don't even think about. Uh, correct. And it's a really good example of, um, you know, when you're so tied up in a business, you often don't see the obvious thing because, you you know, she had a young family and they were busy trying to run things and, you know, da 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 da, da. Um, And anyway, she... Uh, Instead of it being something, something really lame like um, um, you know there, there was no headline. It was just you know, dear dear Bill, we'd love you to look at my new invention. You know, we think it's going to help a lot of people. You know, da da da. You know that that kind of thing, which would ah oh, yeah, how many letters of like that do they get? So, I mean, I I come up with a headline. You know, at last, the world's first flexible and extendable silicon nozzle is now available to Aussie tradies. Um, here's how you can solve the silicon application headaches of your customers without breaking the bank. Then, in inverted commas, the biggest breakthrough for plumbers in 25 years, and it came with a bag of these things and. Um, she sent it off. Um, so we went back and forth critiquing that a couple of times. She sent it off to the, her two big corporate targets. Heard back from her about four or five weeks later, and she said, "I can't believe it. They've accepted it into the store. You know, That's it's going to be all over the country." Yeah. And and then she said, um, the, "The the corporate people said, oh, by the way, um, you know, we've never seen a letter like this. Can we actually use this letter for you know our marketing? It, it's that good. We just can't wait." She said, "Yeah, sure." And I said. You did get money for that letter, didn't you? Oh no! Oh. <laughs> but yeah, that that her goal was just to get it in the store and get right, it in the right. And, and me going, you're like, oh, I want a royalty on those. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, no. But anyway, that, that was a good one. And 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 again, helping a small person like that, um, yeah. you know, That's was huge. really important. And, yeah, and, and it's probably a good lesson too that. Um, you know, in, in the big corporate world, direct response copy can be very effective. You know, my market's Anywhere. different. Anywhere, it doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, you know, my market's too sophisticated for this. You know, that's just an excuse in many ways. Well, Steve, I have one last question having to do with headlines. I really appreciate your time. Before I ask it, tell people where they can, where they can find you or what they should they check out online uh, that you have. Okay. Um, look, I, <clears throat> I run a... Um, uh, a, a private boutique coaching group. Um, it's called Seven Figure Riders. So www.sevenfigureriders.com. Um, you know, if you are only looking to invest a hundred dollars in your training, please don't go there. Um, you'll find it's much more <laughs> um, involved in that. It's a twelve-week pra- uh, training program. I have had people from the states um, uh, join it. We usually find a time that's mutually. Um, mutually acceptable. Um, it, I don't know that there's too many programs like this because what I do is I, I use my, and this is one of the advantages, I guess I have my 20 years teaching experience. We do a small group call every week, so I will send you exercises. You send the, the things, the, the answers to me. I will mark them, critique them, I will send them to other participants who do that. Then we jump on a call and work through all of the copy that you've written. We do that over 12 weeks. Very valuable. I get you to, yeah. oh, it is. It's... Um, and see, the, the the value of that too is is that um, you get multiple perspectives on what you write, um, and you give perspectives on multiple things that you see, um, and so it's kind of a, a dual learning kind of pathway, and and people find that incredibly valuable because they start to see things they otherwise would right. not have seen. Most people um, are making the, fact- the same mistakes probably too as each other, and so you kind of see what people are doing so you can improve your own copy. Oh, abs- that's right. And when you see it in other people, 
you then much more quickly recognize it in yourself. So it is a, an accelerated learning in terms of that. So I get you to write a long form sales letter. We critique that several times. Um, you know, I teach you about interviewing and, and a whole range of things. Send you a manual. Send you a whole lot of other things. So if you are, you know, interested in um, any sort of high intransigent, look, even just check out the letter to see how I've written, to see how I've tried to build in connection at sevenfigurewriters.com. dot com. Yeah. Um, you know, it's put plural, that in Seven figure writers, plural. So, yeah, yep, dot com. Okay. Yeah, I mean that. Just put that in your spot file. I mean, hey, you'll and probably seven the number seven. Yes, the number seven. Yes, www dot seven and then figurewriters dot com. Um, you know, no piece of copy, no piece of marketing is perfect. You probably find some holes in there and things I could have done differently. Um, many ways to be right. So, uh, yeah, that, that's that one. Also, um, if you are interested in, um, I guess, some free training, you can go to. Um, killercopywritingsecrets.com.au you can sign up there for a month you can download whatever you want as a fully paid up member um, and if you do um, you know I'm, I'm happy to offer that to everyone as a, a 30 day free trial um, you know that's that's something that you can go and just get resources um, and if you, you want to stay and that's okay if you don't want to stay then that's okay you don't get any emails from me hey why did you leave you know if you want it you want to just want some free resources check it out right. um, killercopywritingsecrets.com.au um, you know, so that will give you lots of free resources and there's, there's three or four years worth of me doing classroom sessions, uh, me doing critiques um, yeah. you know, and a whole range of stuff so the, a couple of big things we, a section that I really like is called ads that make you puke um, so I pick out a really bad ad and I analyze why it doesn't work and what you could do to improve it. Um, there's a big swipe file section in there, things that um, I've written that have worked really well that you can um, you know, you can swipe. So that particular letter with the, the bent nozzle, um, I've got um, Eve's permission to put that on there for, for my members. Actually, an interesting one on there too in the swipe file section is um, a $2.1 million fax. Um, so from a fax broadcast over a number of years um, for some, some friends of mine um, in the automotive in industry, um, it's brought in for them $2.1 million. Oh. Which is an incredible thing. So I mean, there's some really cool stuff there to swipe and um, and download if you want to. Like I said, it can be a 30 day free trial. Um, after that, it's either 47 a month or 97 dollars a month. If you go the 97 dollar a month path, um, that gets you sending um, stuff to me to critique. Um, and I get I get things all the time. Um, you know, in every industry from catering to mechanics to lawn mowing businesses to you name it. Um, you know, yeah. Yeah, people. And some people stay for, I've had members for three or four years, some people stay uh, one month, some people stay six months. There's no um, compunction on you. Um, if you don't want to be part of it, just let me know when it gets, you know, it gets cancelled. So, right. I mean, that's a, a really good, easy, free resource for you yeah. that, um, you know, sort of no obligation, you, you're not locked into anything. Yeah. Um, so yeah, check check that out. You may look. You may not even like it. If you don't, then that's that's entirely up to you. Um, actually, that's another thing too, Jeremy. Is that um, when if you are looking for for help, um, I, I think it's important to go with people you connect with. Um, you know, not everyone connects with. And, yeah. Yeah, and, and 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 that's okay. There is enough market out there for everyone. Right. Um, you know, and and it's probably one of the mistakes I made early, and one of the mistakes I see a lot of people making when they're just starting out. They they often see the big personality. Yeah. Um, and, and and you automatically think, well, there's the big personality at the top of the tree. Therefore, to be successful, I have to be like the big personality. Yeah. Um, and and you know, in my experience, that just isn't true. Um, you know, there is enough market for everyone out there. You won't connect with everyone. Not everyone will like you, but there is enough people there for you to create your own market. And yeah. just showing up in the marketplace, who you are, is enough for a number of people. And you don't have to be that big personality. If you have a big personality, by all means, be the big personality, but be yourself. Yeah. Um, because you don't have to be like those other people. And I guess the most obvious one is. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm not being in any way disrespectful here. Um, is Dan Kendi with his gruffness? You know, I mean, he, he, he comes his across his personality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Although I've spoken to him um, when he's not on stage, and he's a he's got a really good sense of humor. And um, but you know, you don't have to be gruff. You know that you know being being the gruff man is not necessarily, yeah. um, you know, right for you if that's not you. So turn up as you are, who you are, create your own market, and that will be enough. Yeah. you know, for, for you and for the world. Yeah. 
Steve, I appreciate it. I could probably keep you on for another three hours. I'm going to ask you one last question um, about the headlines. Give me two of your favorite headlines because I know you you look through a lot of them. What are two that we haven't mentioned yet that would be okay. good to leave people with? Um, two that we haven't mentioned. Um, hmm. Or we've mentioned them all. Um, I, I still I, look. I go back to, and I, I probably have an emotional tie to this because um, the farmer one. You know, there's thousands of the bastards. That's probably my all-time favorite headline. It probably has a. Um, a, a bit more of a special connection for me too because the the guy who said it was a, uh, a larger than life character, typical man of the land, could shoot anything, fix anything, build anything, um, do anything um, and he was tragically killed fighting a fire on his property. So oh um, yeah, that was a, a couple of years ago. Wow, um, terrible. You know, so a larger than life character, you know, anyway. Um, so that has a, a special connection for me just from that own personal thing. Um, Look, the other one I, I, I did like um, was a little bit like um, in that trade space. In, instead of it being the, the, the silicon nozzle one, was um, for a, a revolutionary drill bit. Apparently, it, it's, it's able to drill through stuff bigger, better, faster than anything else. And, um, you know, so my headline was just, here's how you can solve an expensive, time-consuming problem for your all-important tradey clients and make a whopping 300% profit doing it. Um, and then the... the 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 the, head, the subhead was um, turn the revolutionary drill drill bit that cuts through ceramic tiles and granite like butter in less than ten seconds, even when using a cordless drill, into your very own profit center. So uh, I liked that because one, it did very well for the client, but two, it it pushed a number of buttons. It, it solved it, like it pushed the greed gland because it, they could make a three hundred percent profit doing it. But you know, people aren't just greedy. People also want to be of service and help. And I, I like it because it it, it it told them that they could solve a problem for their clients, you know, a genuine problem, um, but also make a profit doing it. And and for me, that's a, a big point of connection, yeah. um, you know, because we, yes, the greed gland is important, and we all want more. We all want more money, more time, more this, more that. But we also, you know, people want to help people. Yeah. Um, you know, so that's why I really like that particular headline. Yeah. Steve, I want to be the first one to thank you. This has been amazing. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you. Oh, thank you, Jeremy. I um, I, I've had a great time, and um, um, we probably couldn't have got through as much stuff um in the bar in Stanford as we did um over the last hour or so. So um, That's look, true. I, I hope I hope I've been able to deliver and and live up to the the huge standards that you've um yeah. set. And look, you're doing great work with this too. And um, I just have looked at the list of people you've had there, and holy mackerel, um, you know, I, I'm humbled to be here. So hopefully, I've I've been able to in in some small way live up to you know, those lofty standards that you've, you've set there. For sure, and I really appreciate it. I need more of the Australian greats now. Uh, okay, you cool. I, yeah, okay, I can, um, I can give you some names if you want to, All honestly. Right. And there's a lot of great guys here. Yeah. Fantastic. Thanks, Steve. All right, Jeremy, thanks a lot, mate. Hooray.